So the 1 over s is So that is just 1. Uh, you know what? I better write down, let's see. We'll just do each of these separately. What was going on here? Oh, we rewrote that one. All right. So I think we're ready for this, this one right here, the second term, L inverse 1 over s plus 1, is x e to the minus 1 x right there. So that's on the, using the one on the bottom right here. So our a is uh, negative 1. It's a little strange because they have written as x minus a, but a is negative 1. <coughs> So that's our middle term. Let's go for the first term. It looks really simple. And looking at the very first line in this table, it says L of k is k over s. And so invert both sides, or L, invert bo L inverse both sides. And of course, our k is 1. So L inverse 1 over s is equal to 1. So our first is 1. All right, last up, 1 over s plus 1 squared, which I think is what I was on the way to doing. This looks incorrect, I think. Oh, I know why. The power shut off while I was writing and talking. <laughs> That's exactly why it's incomplete. <laughs> All right, let's fix this. We'll just start over. So this is 27.83 in the table. L of x and e to the a x equals n factorial. Over. Now, some of these would actually be really hard to compute by hand. This one right here, how in the world would you integrate this if you actually wanted to? You'd have to go integration by parts, but the problem is you don't know n, so you'd have to integrate by parts like four or five times until you see the pattern and then extrapolate what would be happening. So some of these are actually quite tricky to figure out. And there are restrictions that I'm not writing down, like on this, s needs to be greater than a, but that's not a huge deal for us right now. If I was going to plug in values or see what, uh, if I wanted to see what values is the solution valid for, that I'd have to look a little more carefully right there. So what is our <coughs> n value? I think we have 2, s plus 1 squared. So Rn, so I need a 2 right there. So n plus 1 equals 2, n equals 1. So I'm using this. I'm just going to rewrite it with uh, 1 in place of n. And 1 factorial is 1 over, and our a is negative 1 again. I should fill in the a value while we're at it. So it's x e to the negative x. Oh no. So there's got to be a mistake somewhere. Absolutely. Yeah, so it uses what we have right here. Yeah, so we just inverted this 
and where a was positive one, no, negative one. So it turns into that right there. So there is our answer. Can you scroll back up to the original equation that we did the transformation? You want the like original problem? Yeah. That one right there? We have n equals two written down earlier. Does that matter for when we found n equals one? So unfortunately there is so each in this table here that I'm looking at, there's an n on each of these. And there's an A there as well. And maybe I should partition this space up a little bit better. So what I did in here, this A, and there's no N in this, but this A is not related to the A that the A's that I wrote before. And then what I did in this section. Uh, like this k value may not be related to some other k value for some other part. And then again, what I did in this section is also separate, and this n right here is unrelated to, I didn't happen to have another n in the other two, but it's unrelated to the n that I wrote at the top. So it might be a good idea to do your uh, actual transformations separately, because you're going to have variables that come up again and again. Just looking in here, a appears on almost every single row in this table. And generally your A won't be the same as an A in another pro or A in another part when you break it up. <coughs> like our K equals one, that K, like this K value came from the partial fraction decomposition, which there's no reason to think that'll be the same numerator as any other term that breaks out of that partial fraction. So that explanation makes sense. You're going to see the same letter used for different, uh, different things just because uh, every row in this table pretty much uses A. A lot of them use N. And I only see one K. But the, each, t each time you use a row, it's a different uh, set of values going in for those letters. So on this table. Yeah, correct. The, well, s is a variable as well. So the variable on the left side of the table is x. You can see that at the top it's f of x equals. Yeah. So that means the variable is uh, x. And if you look at the heading of the second column, it's capital F of s. So the variable in the second column is all s. So you may want to write that down. So in the first column, the variable is x. Yeah. And the second column, the variable's s. And all the other letters you see are constants on both, both sides. So all the a's, all the k's, all the n's, all the b's. There might be some other letter in there, but I think that covers all of them. So all the other letters are constant. So the right column's a function of s, the left column's a function of x. I was trying to figure that out. I tried going further back in the book to, to see if they were special. Yeah, so they're all constants except for x's and s's. And when you go from one to the other, your x, your, it's not correct to say your x turns into your s, because that's not true at all. But your variable changes from being an x to being an s. Do the next problem.
All right, so our procedure, we're going to elbow. Did I write down the procedure for Laplace? I know I wrote down how to line everything up. So let me get back to the really ugly but useful setup. Here we go. So I put a big box around this right here. And I can't really zoom out enough to get the whole thing on the screen. So I'm going to write a really fast procedure, or at least a good starting point. Where in the world do we start? Goodness. Here is the equation that we started with. This is where all the A's came from, basically. So they all came out of this. Uh, so I'm going to see if they'll let me copy and paste this guy. Could have written it this fast. Can't twenty forty five come any quicker? <laughs> All right, so you're going to have this starting equation, and then you pretty much go right into this crazy form that we have written down here. Yeah, so you're going to begin with this right here. So you're going to begin with this original equation. And then all these a n through a zeros and f x, you line them up in this uh, crazy equation, and uh, <coughs> let's see, and including the initial values, uh, and then you just need to figure out. And then you, so I did underline it once, but this guy right here, that's what you're solving for. So we're going to begin with this. So you're going to plug into this mess, uh, solving, solve for L of Y. So I think that's about the best instructions I can give you. So you start with your original, plug into this crazy thing right here, and then eventually solve for L of Y, then for regular Y by doing the L inverse. You can probably write that in a better form on your cheat sheet. OK. So we're going to write down the different uh, a values and our function. So n. So when I write n is 2, that's the degree. It won't necessarily correspond to when I jump to that table at the end. I could very well have different n values. But our degree is 2. And a2. A1, A0, and we need our f function. So A2 is 1, A1 is 3, and A0 is 2. f of x, 12, e to the 2x. All right, now in my other notes, I'm looking back at that table that I just put a huge uh, box around. So we're going to take them and put them into that table, basically. 
So the first row says a n s n. So our n is two. So this is a two a two s squared plus a one s plus a zero l y minus a two s a one y of zero minus and this should just have one term which will be a two y prime of zero equals L of F. So there's a few reasons I'm writing this out. The main reason is I want to, if I just start plugging in values without writing this down, there's a good chance I'll make a mistake and then it'll be really hard to go back and see where did I make that mistake. It's also good if I'm going to be checking your work that I can at least see that you got the right uh, setup initially. So now I'm going to go plug in all the values we have. So we just have 1s squared plus 3s plus 2 L of y minus a2 is 1s plus 3. I do know y of 0, and that was given. Initial condition y of 0 is a 1 minus 1 y prime of 0, negative 1. And we're doing L of f, which is 12 e to the 2x. So any questions on setting this up right here? So although this looks complicated, it's pr if you know what you're doing, this is probably the easiest part to do. It's just can you read your, no your notes carefully or your cheat sheet carefully and line everything up? Uh, after this, so that was step one. Step two, solve for L of Y. Uh, I also have to figure out what in the world is L of this thing. And I'm looking at the table. Before I actually use the table, what can I do first? Just knowing that L is a linear operator. Pull that 12 out. So get the 12 out. So that times 12, this is 12 L e to the 2x. And I should see e to the 2x in the table. This is e to the ax, where a is 2. So this is 1 over s minus 2. So use the table. Don't you may want to compute one or two of these Laplace uh, transforms by hand, but I would mainly use the table for, for these. There's plenty of uh, other things you have to do. Now we're going to clean up the left side. So we got minus s minus 3 plus 1. And I'll worry about factoring this quadratic later when, I, when slash if I need to. Now I wrote two things on the right side, but you don't have to write out a line if nothing changes. So I don't need to write out, I don't need to copy that line down a second time if nothing's going to change. Different story when I'm about to add some things to the other side. So we're going to add an s, and we have minus 2, so it's s plus 2. So use your algebra skills right now, solve for L of y. <coughs> I would probably first go uh, common denominator, add up these fractions. So you just got one fraction. And then divide by that s squared, uh, that quadratic. And then after you do that, partial fractions.
So any questions getting down to this L of Y? <coughs> so you agree with the numerator? Your denominator should definitely be the same. There wasn't much going on there. All right, so we need to go partial fractions. Is our numerator degree too high? So we got numerator degree two, denominator degree three. So you don't need to do any division before you get started on partial fractions. If your numerator degree is the same or higher, you got to go long division. So you want your numerator degree to be lower. All right, so go ahead and do partial fractions. And then I'll put the table up on the board. So do partial fractions first, and then use the table I'll put up on the board. Actually, I'll go partial fractions too to make sure we agree. And then I'll put the table on the board. Now I recommend <coughs> partial fractions is going to take a little bit of space. So what I'm going to do is kind of reserve this space for differential equations. So I'll go do a little algebra zone off to the side. So I don't want to clutter this up with a whole lot of algebra. So I'm going to go partial fractions over here on the right side. So any partial fractions questions? That last one, is it supposed to be S plus 2 on the bottom? 
Certainly, sh I should not have two S minus twos, that's for sure. Looks like, yeah, it should be S plus two. All right, so any partial fractions, questions? All right, so we're gonna copy that over to here. So how do we solve for y? Take the L inverse. Yep, L inverse. And we're going to split it across the addition and subtraction at the same time. And we can bring the uh, constant multiple out as well. Jump over to the table. Ooh, 306. Wow. I think I gave you the wrong homework section then. We'll fix that. It should be the printed 306 page, so. 301, 3.5, there we go. So what row do you need in this table? You need the third one down. There's gonna be a different A for each of those fractions. Uh, so keep that in mind. You're gonna have three different A values, which are completely unrelated to the A0, A1, A2 above. So you may want to do each one of those in a box. So I want you to do this step. You really only need this one line out of the table at the top of the screen. Now another thing that's a good idea in general <coughs> if you're using a table like this is you can take a piece of paper and like block off so you only see the row that you're looking at because the worst thing to happen is like a typo or a righto if you're looking at one line and then you kind of look diagonally across instead of directly across. So that can be really bad. So it might be a good idea to use one of your scratch papers to make sure that your table, you're on the same row in your table. And especially some of these, when you look at them, look really similar. <coughs> so A is negative 2. So this is e to the negative 2x minus 3. e to the negative x plus 3. Oh, whoopsies. Yeah, absolutely. And somehow I got the middle term right. Yeah. <laughs> all right, that is your uh, solution right there. And remember, all these problems, you need initial conditions, and that would mean that you don't get any undetermined coefficients at the end. So you shouldn't see any undetermined coefficients. Now, of course, looking at this, this is constant coefficient. There's another way to, we could have solved this as well. Oh, 
Oh no, we took care of the other part. All right, never mind. We took care of that 12e to the 2x part already. So that's already accounted for. So I don't think we have time to get into another problem. So we'll just look at the, so the problems out of this section are the ones I want you to do. So page 311, so do two problems between 1 and 11, and two from 12 to 21. So the second set here, the 12 through 21, those are actual use Laplace to solve the ODE. The first section is uh, compute some Laplace of some function uh, or determine convergence divergence. So your actual final exam is going to look like uh, more likely the second set. Oh, we can do a theorem now. We got enough time for that. All right, so there's your quiz. And this can be due uh, Monday. So why can't I just use the fundamental theorem of calculus right here? Well, so to use the fundamental theorem, I would sort of have to do a d over d infinity derivative. Because normally I'd be matching that variable with the top, right? So I can't just apply the fundamental theorem right now. Uh, the variable, the uh, endpoint's not a variable. so. I can't just apply that fundamental theorem. Uh, I also don't know anything about f, so I can't really start to take an actual antiderivative. Uh, there is only one thing we can really do here. So taking a derivative and an antiderivative, those operations commute, as long as your functions are nice. Meaning I could, the way it's written, the order of operations are uh, take an antiderivative and then take an s derivative at the end. I can change the order. So I can uh, take the derivative, the s derivative first, and then antiderivative second. So I'm going to switch the order here. And the way that that looks, and the nerdy way to say that is derivative and antiderivative commute. So I'm going to uh, push the derivative past the integral, or through the integral. And if I did extra parentheses, that's the order of operations. We're going inside the green parentheses. All right, what is the derivative of e to the negative sx, f of x? It's easier than it looks. 
Yeah, so s is the variable. x is not the variable. S bar is this derivative. That's a different story when you move to the antiderivative, but. So I'll copy down everything else. So it's just derivative e to the negative sx, which is negative s e negative sx fx dx. Oh, absolutely. Wow. Details. All right. So we have this. It would have been nice if there was an S. So I could just bring that outside the uh, integral, but that's not OK. However, in this form, there is an anti-differentiation trick or tool we can use. What can we use here without knowing anything about the function f? So we could try integration by parts. And what will that look like? Oh, let's be lazy and not even do that. So we will do something slightly different. So we can bring the negative 1 out. That's pretty easy to do. I'm going to rearrange this ordering. Like that. So that's just some easy calculus algebra stuff right there. Just reordered it. I could try integration by parts, but let's do something slightly different. This is equal to negative 1 times L of what function of x? x, f of x. So this is negative 1 L x, f of x. What did we actually start with? We started with DDS of, I could write this, original is uh, L of f of x. So we just found that the s derivative of the Laplace of f is negative L of x f of x. Not obvious at all, but if you trace through it, yes, it is true. All right, what is, last question, what is the second derivative of L of f of x? So I don't know what the second derivative is, but I do know what the first derivative is. So write down what the first derivative is. And this derivative passes through the negative sign. What is the s derivative of L of this new function? Yep, it'll be another, another negative comes out and another times x goes in. And if that's tricky to see, no problem. Uh, we'll make a quick substitution. So we can write it like this. And then the exact same rule we did. There, we made no assumptions on f other than it needs to be, probably needs to be differentiable and or, uh, it needs to be relatively nice, uh, either differentiable or continuous, or both. Well, differential implies continuous, obviously. So this is negative, negative Lx, Gx, right there. So that's just applying the same thing we just did above. So the s derivative of L of G of x is x. You just multiply it by x and make it negative. And so it's going to be positive Lx squared fx. All right. Good stuff. It's a good theorem to end on. So I can find the nth derivative if I wanted to. Just alternate signs n times, and then you get x to the n right there. So you can do higher derivatives if you need to.